In today's episode, we're going to tackle a project that's been on my mind for a little while. I want to see if we can turn this regular horseshoe into a knife. Let's see what happens. I'm Jeff, and you're watching Home Build Workshop. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the shop. I hope your day is going great. Show of hands for those of you that have ever gotten a project stuck in your head for quite some time, and you just can't stop thinking about it. You may forget about it for a little while, but then it pops back up, and you just keep thinking about wanting to try a particular thing or build a particular item. That's what today's project is for me. So in order for me to stop thinking about it, we just gotta tackle it and give it a shot. Now, I would probably say that for the majority of you, when you think of a horseshoe, this would be what you're thinking of. This is just a standard steel horseshoe. But this is not the horseshoe that we're going to be using today. This is the shoe that we're going to be using. This shoe is called a slider. Now these sliders are typically used for reining horses and they're meant to allow them to slide to a stop during their performance events. But in talking to my local farrier, these are a high carbon steel. A regular shoe is not, which tells me that if we harden this, it's probably gonna hold an edge much better than if we were to use a standard regular steel shoe like this. Now, when this idea popped into my head, it was really only because I was carrying a pair of these, kind of like this, and I got to thinking, boy, that sort of feels knife-like. It's already a high carbon steel. So what happens if we do a little bit of shaping on here, some stock removal, maybe add some wooden scales. What kind of a, maybe an Ulu style knife could we make out of this? Let's find out. The first thing I wanna do is just spend a couple minutes using the belt grinder just to clean this up a little bit. I believe I'm gonna to need to weld these holes shut. In order to do that, I wanna make sure that the metal's nice and clean. This is a used shoe, so it's kinda of got some dirt and crud on there. Now we'll use the old antique MIG welder and try to weld those holes shut. This didn't work quite as well as I was hoping, as you'll see later, but for this test run, it's gonna be just fine. And it's back to the belt grinder to clean up those welds. Now the reason that I wanted to weld these holes shut is because this is the side that I'm going to form the blade from. And I don't want those holes to interfere with any strength of the blade. Plus, I don't know, it might end up looking a little bit weird. Either way, now the holes are filled in and we're ready to move on. Now before I start grinding the blade, I kind of want to figure out where the handle's going to go so that I have a couple of reference points to know where to stop removing material. I think I'm just going to roughly mark out a spot here where maybe the handle will go. Yeah, I think that's gonna work pretty good. Now I think I can just start tapering in a blade. Hopefully that's not easier said than done. As I'm grinding away this material, it does create quite a bit of heat. Now at this step of the process, it's not really gonna affect the metal at all, but it does make it a bit uncomfortable to hold. So to try to keep the piece cool, I'm dunking it in water every so often. Oh, that's hot. <laughs> But it looks cool. After all that grinding, well, it sort of looks like a blade and I'm kind of liking it. Although it's far from perfect right now, it's actually quite difficult, maybe because I have limited experience with this sort of thing, to get a nice even grind. But we're gonna see if we can clean it up a little bit using some sandpaper. Now I'm not trying to get it at its final shape just yet, but I wanna get the bulk of the material removed before we harden this blade later on. I decided to start by using a file to even out everything as best I could before switching over to some sandpaper on a flat stick. The sandpaper ended up working out really well. I was able to get it a lot smoother than it was right off the belt grinder. Oh. 
after sanding this with 120, I'm a lot happier with it. It looks a lot more even, a lot more refined. I'm gonna stop there at 120 grit. After we harden the blade, we're gonna need to do some more final sanding so that we can get this polished up. I think now's a good time to drill some holes where the handles are gonna go so that we can use some pins to hold the scales in place. Scales are just another name for the handle. To determine where I want the pins to go, I'm just holding this as I would if it was completed and marking out roughly where the handles are going to end. And then I'll just mark in locations for three pins. At the drill press, I'll drill some 5 30 seconds holes, which is the size of the pins that I'm going to use. It's really important at this step to clamp your workpiece down. You don't want to try to hold it with your hand because if that drill bit catches, it could send that thing sailing around and it's going to hurt if it hits you. At this point, I've got the bulk of the shaping done. Most of the material that we need to remove has been removed. The holes are drilled for the pins which will secure the handles. We're ready to harden this blade. If you saw the video where I made the little finger planes, you'll remember that I made those irons from a table saw blade. I hardened those myself by heating them up with a map torch. Since the blade was so small, it worked really well. But on a blade this size, a little map torch just isn't going to cut it. So I had to call in for some backup on this one. Thankfully, my local farrier is really cool and agreed to let me use his forge to plop these in. So we're going to use his forge to heat these up until they're non-magnetic, around that 1400 degree mark, somewhere around there. Then we're going to quench them in some oil, harden these blades up. Hopefully nothing breaks in the process. Let's do this. After putting these pieces in the forge, it really only took a few minutes before they were hot enough to where they became non-magnetic. Once they reached that temperature, I pulled them out and quenched them in some used motor oil. There's the first one. Now for the second one. This one I think was a little bit hotter because it spent an extra minute or so in the forge. That smells wonderful. And there we go. Let's head back to the shop and continue on this project. Well, that was pretty cool. I like how the second one especially caught on fire. Although I was a little bit worried that the whole thing might go up in flames, but it didn't. Now these things should be hard. Let's check them with a file. If we've done this correctly, the file should skate over the metal instead of biting in and trying to cut it away. Fingers crossed. I think we're good to go. Before I move on to the tempering process, I'm going to spend a few minutes and try to clean these pieces up. There's a lot of residue left over from quenching these in the used motor oil, so I want to try to see if any of this will come off. I'm going to try wiping these down with some denatured alcohol and see if that removes any more of this residue. The main reason that I want to try to clean these up at least a little bit is because the next process that I need to do is the tempering process. Right now, this metal is so hard that it's actually brittle. So if we were to use this as a knife, there's a chance that we could just snap this blade. In order to remove some of that brittleness, I need to put this in the oven at 400 degrees for an hour. And I need to do that for two cycles. So it needs to spend a total of about two hours in the oven getting that tempering process done. That way it won't be so brittle. And the only oven that I have to use is my home oven. So I kind of don't want to bake a bunch of used motor oil in the home oven, if at all possible. Otherwise, I could probably just throw these in a toaster oven or something and not worry about it. But I'm going to at least make an attempt to clean these up a little bit. I think that's about as good as it's going to get. 
I've got the oven preheated to 400 degrees. I'm gonna place these in there for one hour, then I'm gonna take them out, let them cool, then I'm gonna put them back in the oven at 400 degrees and let them cook for another hour. By then they should be ready to move on and finish cleaning all this up and getting it sharpened. They're not sealed in foil, but I did place the blades in some foil just to catch any material that may potentially flake off. While the blade is going through the tempering process, it's gonna spend a few hours in the oven. It's probably enough time to knock together some sort of a leather sheath so that I don't cut myself on it, and also to help protect the blade. To make the sheaths, I traced out these blades on a piece of cardboard, then scanned it into the computer and redrew it in Fusion 360. From there, I was able to make adjustments to the file and also draw out some extra pieces that would become the leather sheath. Once I had all the pieces drawn out, I saved that file as a DXF, which I could then import into Lightburn to send over to the Xtool D1 Pro laser engraver. I'm finding it's really fun to be able to draw up some shapes and cut it out on the laser. Like in most leatherworking projects, order of operations here is going to become very important. These two pieces are going to get stitched together along the bottom, which will form a little pouch that our blade will slip into. But if I stitch that together now, I'm going to have no way to get inside there and install the snap hardware for this little strap. This little strap will get fastened on the back side and then on the front, there'll be a snap which will hold the blade in place. I need to install that hardware first before we worry about stitching this together. Since I used the laser cutter to cut all the holes for all of the hardware, this goes really quick. I'll just pop the snaps into place and I'm using a simple hand snap setter to set the snaps into the leather. And to secure this strap on the back, I could use a rivet to hold that in place, but to keep this quick and simple, I'm just gonna use a Chicago screw. Now, when I talked about Chicago screws in the last leatherworking video that I posted, I got a couple questions on that, so I wanna give a little bit of a close up, kind of what they are, in case you're unfamiliar with Chicago screws. These little tiny guys here are what's known as a Chicago screw. Why it's called a Chicago screw, I really couldn't tell you. I've searched that information up and could not find a definitive answer. So if you happen to have any insight into the history on that, leave it down in the comments. These little guys are great additions to your leatherworking toolkit. They make assembly of pieces quick and simple and also makes it really easy to swap things out because they just unscrew. This side has a post with a hollow hole in the middle that's threaded to accept this little teeny screw end here. And the way that these things work, one side goes through the piece that you're going to be attaching. You can see how that little threaded portion sticks through there. Then you just take your screw and you just tighten the screw down onto the backing post. and it's secure. Quick and simple, these things are great. Now one slight downside is that since these thread together, there is a chance that over time things can work loose. If you need to prevent that, a common thing is just to put a little drop of glue, like regular wood glue even works good. I've used that several times. It just adds a little bit of friction to the threads and helps it from backing out, but you can still remove it using a screwdriver. These things are great. Now we're ready to glue these pieces together and get this stitched up. As soon as this contact cement has tacked up, we'll stick it together. I always tap down my seams to help promote a better bond in the contact cement. To make punching the holes for the stitching easier, I scribed a line with the laser. I just reduced the power so it just made a mark 
and I've already got a line to follow, it's going to make it quick and simple. Instead of punching all these by hand, I decided to try lightly putting my punch in the drill press and using the arbor on the drill press to help me punch the holes. This worked really well and I think saved quite a bit of time. Easy. With the holes all punched, I'll grab my stitching pony, which I made in a previous video. There's a link in the description if you want to see how I made this. And we're going to stitch this piece together. I'm using a classic saddle stitch with some waxed thread. When I'm done stitching, I'll burn the end lightly to help keep the thread from unraveling. And this little sheath is complete. With the sheets complete, I've also got the blades out of the oven. They've got a nice straw color on there, which tells me that the tempering process went to plan. Now we just need to spend a fair bit of time with some sandpaper and get these things completely cleaned up. After I've sanded them all smooth, then I'm going to hit them lightly with the buffing wheel to really shine up this metal. I'm now ready to epoxy the handles in place. Before I do that, I'm going to wipe everything down with some denatured alcohol just to clean up any residue or anything like that that could impede my glue joint. I want to keep this epoxy off of the blade, so to do that I'll just wrap it in some blue painter's tape. For the handles, I'm going to use some black walnut that I've glued a thin veneer on the inside. We'll stick these together with some double-sided tape, and using some more double-sided tape, I'll stick the blade temporarily to the blanks. Now to drill press, I'll use these holes that I drilled previously as pilot holes to drill all the way through the pieces that'll become the handles. That way I know everything's going to line up when we epoxy this in place. I'm going to drill these holes one at a time, and once I have the first hole drilled, I'll use one of the pins tapped into place to kind of pin everything together and prevent things from shifting around. With the handles firmly pinned in place, now I'll head over to the bandsaw and trim away the excess, being extremely careful not to hit the metal horseshoe with the bandsaw blade. Now I want to take these handles back off. We need to do a little bit of contouring around this front edge before we glue them on. The reason we need to do it now is because once they're glued in place, there's really no good way to get to this front edge. If I can get it off there, get off there. There you go. All I really need to do at this point is just kind of round this over, make it look a little neater. We'll use the belt grinder to do that. And now it's time to mix up some five minute epoxy and finally get these handles attached to the blades. I'm applying the epoxy to one handle first. I'll stick that in place and then insert the pins to hold it in alignment. Then I can add the epoxy to the other handle, line everything up and tap the pins all the way through. I'll wipe up some of the squeeze out with some denatured alcohol and then we'll clamp it up. Well, that was the longest drying five minute epoxy I think I have ever used. 
The package said it was supposed to set up in five minutes, be completely cured in one hour. Well, after six hours, it was still a little bit tacky feeling. So I ended up letting this sit overnight. Now it feels really good. And I think we're ready to move on and get everything shaped. So much for trying to save some time by using five minute epoxy. I'll sand off as much as I can using the belt grinder because it's really the fastest method that I have in my shop. From there, I'll switch to my oscillating spindle sander because I can get to the inside of the horseshoe with this and it worked really good also. Now that all of the wood is flush with the edge of the horseshoe, I'm gonna carefully use my little router table and put a round over on all of the sides of the handles. This saved a lot of time, but I had to make sure that I had everything set correctly so that the cutters did not hit the metal of the horseshoe. Now it's time for everyone's favorite step in any project. Yes, that's the sanding. I ended up sanding these up to 400 grit so that it was nice and smooth. And this really completed all of the work left on this project. There's only one thing missing and that's a sharp edge. I found out pretty quick that due to the shape of this blade, it's actually kind of tricky to sharpen these. The curve and angles to the blade make it kind of awkward to use a bench type sharpening stone or some sort of a sharpening jig. I ended up using the diamond stones from my TS Prof knife sharpener and just using them handheld was the best way to do it. To help keep track of the progress, I shine a light straight down onto the blade and if you can see any glints of light on the top edge of the blade, you know that the edge is blunt in that area and you need to spend a little more time sharpening there. After quite a bit of time with the sharpening stones, this is finally feeling pretty sharp. To finish off the sharpening process, I'm gonna give this thing a couple of passes on my leather stropping belt on the belt grinder. Now that this thing is nice and sharp, <laughs> that's a fine time to wipe on a coat of finish. I'm gonna use boiled linseed oil. I'm gonna wipe it not only on the handles, but I'm gonna carefully wipe it on the entire blade. Since this is not a stainless steel, the linseed oil hopefully will help protect it a little bit from rust. I love the way that little strip of maple looks in between the walnut and the steel. And that's a wrap on these knives. I am really happy with the way these turned out. Since it's a combination of a horseshoe and an ulu knife, I'm gonna call it the horseshoe knife. This black walnut with the maple veneer on the inside, I think it looks really cool. Now I have two of these because, well, at the beginning of the project, I wanted to have two of these blades. That way, if I made a mistake on one, at least I had the other one that I could continue the project, but both of them turned out awesome. So now I have a pair. It's like some sort of weird weapon from some video game or something. <laughs> you can see really well what I was talking about with the welds earlier. The welder just did not burn in here very well. Other than that, I think these look awesome. So while they look cool, do they cut anything? Let's test it out. We'll start off with a piece of paper, just fold it into quarters. Cuts paper. How about cabbage? Will it cut cabbage? <laughs> I'd say it cuts cabbage and probably anything else you put in its way. This is one of those projects that's been on my mind for quite a while. And now that it's done, I can empty that mental space and make room for more projects. Hope you guys enjoyed the making of the horse Shulu knives. Thanks a lot for watching. Have an awesome day. We'll see you next time.
coleslaw anybody? Uh -huh.